So if all my solutions are continuous, are smooth, this feature should allow me to exactly analytically solve this conservation law, right? So, so actually, if my solution is continuous, I don't really need any numerical methods. So for example, I have an initial condition, t equal to zero. So let's, let's say I have all the solutions available over here. Then I can basically start from every point in the solution a characteristic because I know which direction it goes. For example, if I know it's positive, I shoot forward. If I know this is this, I shoot it this way. If I know this is <coughs> negative, I shoot it that way, right? So at every point, I can shoot a ray into the future. And I know the solution along that ray is going to be constant. So I know all my future solution, don't I? No, because these intersect, right? Because these actually run into each other. And when they run each other, should I pick the, the value on the left or should I pick the value on the right? OK, so, so in here, actually, I think we actually see a case where there are two lines. I, I mean, these are, uh, these are discontinuities. I mean, we, we can see things run into each other. So, so what happens when characteristics run into each other? What should I pick? Yes? Oh, if I have just the two values running into, uh, I, I, can, I can do that. But like, in general, I have things continuously run into each other, right? So I have infinitely many characteristic lines. And they are continuous. They are everywhere. Here, of course, I'm only drawing contours at a discrete level because, I mean, otherwise the whole thing is going to be black. But in reality, things are everywhere. Every single point has a characteristic line. So, so I get things everywhere run into each other continuously. So, so in order for us to analyze that, we need something other than the primitive form. This is because once we have things running into each other, we know, OK, immediately towards the left of the solution, I still know its value. Immediately towards the right of the solution, I know its value. But the solution may be discontinuous over that point. And when things are discontinuous, what do I mean by partial f of u, partial x, over a discontinuity? OK, what does that mean? If u is not continuous, f of u, do I expect to be continuous? No. I mean, if I don't even have continuity, not to say differentiability, how can I take spatial derivatives? It doesn't make any sense. Right? So the problem about nonlinear conservation laws, the reason we cannot use finite difference, is because the characteristic lines, they run into each other. They are not straight. And because they are not straight, they run into each other. And the moment they run into each other, it doesn't make any sense anymore to take a spatial derivative. So what can we do? Use the integral form, yes. Otherwise, why are we here studying numerical PDEs? <laughs> so so use, use integral form. Use integral form. And that's why we got rid of the spatial derivative by integrate, integrating over x. So we have d dt integration over a b u dx plus f of u at b minus f of u at a equal to 0. And let's analyze the behavior around the continuity by choosing A and B very close to that discontinuity. So think of the solution. Look at the solution here. We want to choose an interval that 
is very very small infinitesimal interval that still a the left of the interval is to the left of the discontinuity and the right of, right side of the interval b is to the right of the discontinuity all right so what happens is that the value of the function u at a is basically the left hand side of the discontinuity so i mean among that discontinuity you can see like you have a range of values the value goes the lowest value which is the right hand side value is minus 0.6 something and the left value is 0.7 something right so so we have a u left and a u right so by choosing that interval um, let's say the discontinuity is at discontinuity at c and that discontinuity actually moves as time increases right so so for example if you look at this thick line this thick line is a function of of t right so it moves just like characteristics but they don't follow straight lines they can turn right so let's figure out how do they move so discontinuity at c of uh, which which may depend on time and let's see how it moves So let's say a is equal to c minus epsilon and b is equal to c plus epsilon that means um, U at a is equal to u let's say uh, U left so so to denote the left value u of b is equal to u right so Integration of a b u dx is equal to what? Right, we have a domain a b very very small. On the left hand side, it's equal to u l. On the right hand side, is equal to u r. The interval is so small that we can consider the function to be constant on the left and right of this shock. So what is this integral of u over dx? Yes, it's u l plus u r uh, divided by two times epsilon, right? Oh, two epsilon. Yes. So it's uh, it's u l plus u r times epsilon. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So I am I'm interested in analyzing how that value changes as time evolves because. As time increases, let's say time increases to the next level, the shock may go over here, right? <coughs> so, so what is that? What is that wave speed? What is that wave speed? So, what is discontinued at c? Let's modify it c plus a shock speed. So SS called shock speed times times T. So so let's say this is the this is the uh, okay. So let's 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 make it a little bit more rigorous. C is a function of T, and uh, uh, we want to compute the shock speed, which is defined as dC over dt. Okay. And so this A is at c at time equal to 0 minus epsilon b is equal to c at time equal to 0 plus epsilon so as time increases by uh, infinitesimal delta t this is at c0 and this is now at c0 plus shock speed times this infinitesimal dt so ul plus ur times epsilon are at t equal to 0 and at t equal to a very small dt integration of u between a and b has changed by how much uh, so this is c0 right uh, in the initial initial time this is when the shock has moved by a little bit and the speed of the movement is ss so over dt it should move towards the right by ss times dt and at t equal to dt the total integral 
has changed from this value, which is underneath this red curve, to this value underneath the blue curve. So what is the delta? What is the change in the integral? The change in the integral is equal to minus of this area, right? The change in the integral is equal to minus of ur minus ul times ss dt, of course, plus the original uh, x at t equal to 0. Can we compute the time derivative d dt of this integral between a and b is equal to what? The difference between this and this, uh, the difference between this and this divided by dt, which is ul minus ur uh, times ss, right? So why am I doing this? The reason I'm doing this is because we have related the speed of the shock, the speed of the discontinuity, to the left hand side, to I mean the first term in the integral form of the equation. Because the, the first term in the integral of the equation, the time derivative of the total mass within this small interval is equal to the flux at the left minus the flux at the right also over this very small interval. Then I can compute from the difference in the flux the speed of the shock wave. So let's do that. So let's write down the integral form of the equation where a and b are very small intervals around the discontinuity is equal to f of u at x equal to a minus f of u at x equal to b and this term we know is is what is ul minus ur so ul minus ur uh, times the speed of the shock wave right how about the right hand side x equal to a, the value of u is exactly ul, right? That's right at the left of the discontinuity. So this is equal to f of ul minus, this is x equal to b to the right of this discontinuity, that's f of ur. So this is easy. That allows us to compute the speed of the shock wave being f of ul minus f of ur divided by ul minus ur. Oh, it's a very good question. Is that df by du? Right. So this looks very similar to df du because that looks like a finite difference approximation to df du, right? But this is special because this is more because df du only works when we have a con continuous solution. So at the limit of a very, very small discontinuity, this, the speed of this, how, how, uh, the speed of this very small discontinuity is actually and should be equal to the characteristic speed or the speed of the wave. But this formula gives, gives you more. It gives you the speed of a large discontinuity also. It gives you how would a... a a non-infinitesimal discontinuity would propagate. 